everybody. I'm Harlan. Um, so going to be talking about SAMHSA closure and these things called transducers that kind of tie the two together very well. Um, so just to get a feel for where everybody's coming from, um, who, who is actually using SAMHSA right now? Everybody? Sweet. Um, production? A lot of you, almost production? Cool. Um, so let's see. Have you like beaten up, beaten it up too much, or are you just kind of like uh, it's working good and yeah? Okay, we beat it up a lot. Um, we had trouble, and you know we kind of had to. So, um, and how about closure um, or functional programming? High level, a lot of you sweets. Um, and yeah, so I haven't given a talk in a while, so and this is my first time talking about this. So if I'm like completely off track, you don't know what I'm talking about, or you're bored, just like raise your hand and I'll try to fix that. So, all right, first thing, um, so I'm just going to kind of talk about what we did. We basically built uh, V2 of an internal system that we were working on. Um, so we looked at a few options, you know, the typical, um, you know, storm and, and um, we decided that SAMHSA operationally was like probably the best choice. Um, all these things are like already JVM, so that's kind of you know what we're going with. It's our first Java project at the company. Um, we liked operationally that SAMHSA does kind of horizontal partitioning, um, which is like in line with a lot of big systems that are you know coming out today. Um, so you know it's it's single process, so you know basically like. As long as you're you're running it um, in a way that's partitioned fairly evenly, um, you're not going to get weird behavior when you've got a bunch of jobs on one machine. Um, so decided Sam's is cool. Um, closure, you know, we had a, somebody on our team who was kind of like heading up some of the work. Who he was really into it. You know, we we weren't super super into closure, but you know, we're like, okay, is it at least as good as Java? So we kind of went about looking at it like that. Um, so we decided, okay, let's look at the interop. The interop is good. Um, you can basically use, I don't have a pointer, so I'm gonna use my mouse. Um, you know, you can implement interfaces, that's cool. SAMHSA is very much about the interfaces. Um, you know, you can, you can use JVM things like constants in a first class way. Um, you can call methods in a closure-like way or a Java-like way. So we decided, and, and also everything like compiles to reasonable bytecode. Like you look at it, it runs pretty good, you know, so cool, Java interrupts good. Um, tooling, actually very nice, um, lining in. Um, you know, we didn't know about it before, but we looked at it and it's like, you know, you can run your program just fine, you can make a standalone jar, you can generate a POM, so we can use our Jenkins, we can use our IntelliJ, whatever we want. You know, get all the Maven dependency goodness without those ugly POM files. But it generates them for you, so anything that wants to consume it, you know, cool. So let's go closure. Um, and then, you know, repling is something that we didn't really foresee or look at, but it's been like the most, the most productive thing that I've come across in development for a long time. Ah, oh, thank you. Talks at big companies. <laughs> cool. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So, SAMHSA closure. Let's go to work. Let's make some pipelines. So, well, how fast can SAMHSA go? Was our first question. Slow. Do you guys agree with that? SAMHSA's pretty fast, right? <laughs> it is. It is. But, um, you know, so we, we set about looking at the pieces. Like, is it Kafka that's slow? No, Kafka's really fast. We looked at batch sizes and things like that before the new version of Kafka got rid of that. Um, decided, you know, the defaults are the best. Um, and I guess they decided that too. So is it AWS? Nope. Uh, the disk speed and the network speed are both, you know, as promised and equal, which is helpful. Like. You know, you got about 125 megabyte network, 125 megabyte disk, cool. So it wasn't that. So what 
our, our code was already fast. We benchmarked it. So what was wrong? Ideas? No. Um, so it was, we didn't test with serializers. The serialization was really slow. Um, so little, little side note, um, our original um, ingest mechanism came from, a, since we already have an existing network that we were taking traffic off of, um, we, were, we basically had a Python process that was pushing it into Kafka, and then our SAMHSA pipeline was doing the rest of the work. Um, so we knew that message pack was fast because we do a lot of Python where, at PubNub where um, you know, we developed this. So we set about, we made a message pack serializer in Java, still wasn't quite delivering. It's pretty slow in Java. Womp womp. So we then kind of looked at a bunch of other serializers, um, namely Eden, um, because you know it's fast in Clojure, is it fast in Python? You know, not so much. We decided Protobuf gave us the best speed in both systems together. So um, we haven't looked at Avro. We know that um, things like uh, you know Confluent is using. They decided to use Avro. Um, we like the schema. We're happy with the speed, so we we moved on. You know, like we can't spend forever like looking at the pieces. Um, so um, I can get you some numbers if you want. Anyone want numbers? <laughs> okay. So uh, we did not. Um, is Bison faster than this? <laughs> not really. No, we did not. Um, we benchmark. These were our benchmarks, and since we have Python and Java, um, the best balance between the two was was um, Protobuf CPP for Python, which is still, you know, uh, order of magnitudes, you know, two orders of magnitude slower than in Java. But you know, and we actually did eventually replace that part of our system because it was just. It was slowing down everything, and you know, just wrote a little Sansa task, and uh, we we made a zero MQ um, consumer factory for Sansa, which um, it's not out in the world yet, but we're using it. It's it's just a, a zero MQ pull socket, and it's you know it's giving us awesome performance. So, um, if anyone has numbers on Avro or or Bison that they can share, like that would definitely be cool to look at. But for now, you know. Everything's in Java now, and we're seeing, you know, four microsecond encoding and six microsecond decoding. So it's it's fine for us for now. Um, all right. So, all right. Now we're fast enough. So now we hook it up to to our, some staging traffic, um, just like actually test this because uh, so previously, um, you know, we were just kind of doing like a small fraction of traffic, and so now we're kind of like ramping it up to like full full region traffic. Um, cool, everything's great. Just kidding. <laughs> um, so now we saw, you know, our, our pipeline is very fast, but now our, our pretty fast aggregator was looking a little bit slow. We were kind of seeing um, bursty behavior. We weren't quite sure what, what the source of it was. Um, so, you know, we, in our back pocket, we also sort of had you know, after watching all these, you know, getting into closure, you like watch tons of videos and read all these articles, you get all these cool ideas about, you know, these different ways of doing things, your mind expands. Um, that's my closure sales pitch, it's pretty sweet. Um, so, you know, we decided we'll go ahead, we'll build this streaming aggregator as opposed to, we, we just basically in, in this one function, we had our aggregator function. Um, so. It, you know, we told it what fields we wanted, what aggregation functions we wanted, and it went through the whole sort of relational algebra thing as like one string of you know closure expressions. Um, but you know, it was it was bursty. We thought maybe that was the problem. Um, you know, spoiler. You know, it might have been it might have actually had more to do with the GC. But at the time, you know, it was our first. You know, I'd, I'd use Java from like a you know desktop application and like small scale web application perspective. But never anything where I'm pumping like, you know, dozens of megabytes per second through a process. So it's, it was a little bit different to to deal with that kind of scale and actually like have to care about GC things. Um, anyway, so we had the design. We went about building it. Um, we had just found out that 
there were these things called transducers that came out in like August or something last year. Um, so, and it was like very, you know, the signature of it was very much like that of a SAMSA task. Um, so, you know, we were like, okay, we'll try transducers. We'll see what's up with this. Um, just for, oops, for comparison, um, you know, transducers are these, these sort of like functions. Um, these are like kind of the important, the important signatures of it. So it's like a three arity function. Um, this is when you get a message, take the input and return the result basically. This is when you're at the end of your stream, you know, you're done, finalize, flush whatever else you have if you're kind of doing some kind of aggregator or some, you know, like you've got some partial results, you didn't get the input that you would need to trigger the next flush. So this will give you one last chance to flush that out. So if you think about it, you know, what does a SAMSA task look like? It's got, you know, you've got stream task, which has just the process method, which takes an envelope. You've got the windowable task, which just takes, you know, the collector. It's like, you know, so you process a bunch of messages and every, say, 1,000 milliseconds or, or, you know, every minute or whatever, you run this window function and that basically flushes out your aggregation results and then you start over. And it's all single threaded, so there's not like weird blocking conditions or anything like that. It's just like process, 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 window, process, 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 window. So, you know, that's, that's what a transducer is. Sweet. So that was kind of a, oops. So, you know, it's like a hypothesis, but it like, it's like very like synergistic, right? So trans water, like what is a transducer for people who don't know? It's basically a step in a process decoupled from, are you taking it from a collection? Are you taking it from an async channel? Basically, the way that it works is since you give it, the, you know, this is all like kind of like abstract, but this XF is basically um, equivalent of say send. If you're using core async channel, XF would be send. If you're using a collection, um, it would be like cons or enclosure, it's conj, which is basically put it onto the the end of a list or into a map or, you know, conjoin is sort of what it's, it's short for. So, you know, or in, or in the stream processing case, it might be, you know, publish or process. Like logically, you can give this thing like a different name. It does the same thing. It's just like a variable, you know, so um, it's pretty academic. It's like a new idea. So, so it, you know, it's intuitively it made sense to us after looking at SAMSA and looking at transducers together so much. So, so it's, it's this weird function that lets you process and window. It's got some weird names, but you can make it friendly. So in addition, um, and also I should mention, it's, it's not a closure specific thing. It's invented by the creator of closure. It's a first class citizen in closure 1.7, which is uh, beta two right now. Um, we've been using it since alpha one, so it's like, it's fine. Um, it's not giving us any problems at all. But so what does this mean? It means you can compose your trans, you know, your transducible process with step one, step two, you know, so each of your SAMSA jobs has, is a series of smaller steps. Um, and these things can be kind of decomposed and moved between jobs, et cetera. So you, uh, a helpful way to think about this is think about this is a SAMSA task, or this is a SAMSA task at the worst case. And in between these, there's some you know, there's a s intermediate message stream behind this. Like, that's what both of these things have in common. They're both for processing streams of messages. So a transducer is, you know, it's a smaller scale. It's an abstraction at the language level. SAMSA is a platform that runs at, you know, massive, massive scale. But these two are like, you know, they're the same thing. Um, so, you know, how does it, you know, we'll get a little bit more on these later, but how does it work? I mean. So when you think about what a transducer is, you know, it sort of makes sense. You can, you can run it on a collection, a core async, um, a custom built transducer, like say a SAMSA task. Um, but really what it gives you is there's no intermediate collection when you're building these things. It's basically function calling, function calling, function calling, function. So you think, you know, it just piles up the stack. 
It makes your stack a little bit deeper, but you have pre-allocated stack space anyway, so what's the big deal? And concretely what that means is, you know, Java is a garbage collected language, so it go away anyway. Why do we care about creating too many objects? Well, if you're processing, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 messages per second, that puts a lot of G pressure on the GC. And so what this does is it just lets you, you know, use the stack. You don't have to create anything in between your steps. And so that like really unlocks a lot of performance. Um, so concretely, SAMS is a transducer. So these, these are, sorry it's cut off a little bit, but there's, um, this is the same as that. So we're not missing anything. So in terms of SAMSA, so this is a, just a simple one that doesn't have any aggregation. This one will just say if you get two of the same messages in a row, only, only pass on the first one and drop the rest. I mean, it's, it's, it's trivial, but it'll help us understand like what we're trying to do. So, you know, we've got a little bit of state. Um, so this, this is kind of a class. This is the SAMSA stream task interface. This is the stream task method. The types, it is, it is typed, so you're not getting any reflection penalties. Um, since this is implementing an interface, the compiler can figure out, you know, this is incoming message envelope, this is message collector, this is task coordinator. Um, this is no reflection because we know that envelope is a incoming message envelope, et cetera. So, you know, what do we do here? We take the key of the message that we can pass it on. We take the input, which is the message itself. It can be anything because all we're doing is, you know, if, if this message is not equal to the prior message, then we send it and we also capture the current message as the prior one. So, um, so you look at a, uh, a closure transducer, it's, it's the same thing. You know, previous, so here's your, your process function here, you know, can kind of ignore that now, but like, so the input is like the envelope and, you know, same logic. So just, I'm just trying to kind of show that these are, you know, the same idea, just in kind of different packaging. So, cool, right? So, okay, now we have to kind of rethink how we write our algorithms in some way. Like, you know, you think about doing all this stuff in this procedural way, but now we've just, we've got all these steps. So, you know, using filter in the language, we can kind of like drop some of the messages. Using mapping, we can go, say, from protobuf to a closure map. Um, we can also, we can augment it with information, like say we have an IP address and we want to do a geo lookup in a, an augmenting task, we can just like attach it and pass the message on um, using map again. And then any kind of aggregation you want to do, you need to kind of loop over your accumulated data. Like um, I'll show you an, another example in a second. But so, you know, you accumulate a bunch of data in process and in window you publish it out. Um, so another example. So this one's just counting. So um, I should have swapped these, but so basically for every message you get in, um, hopefully the closure syntax isn't too, too foreign and you can kind of follow what's going on. Um, basically this is, so kind of cut off again, but so atom zero is just like, it's a mutable um, container that you can do operations on. It starts with zero. Um, and so that's kind of down here. But so every time you get a message, simply increment your count. Don't publish anything, just increment your count. And so you kind of have messages coming in on one topic, you're incrementing your count. And now windowable task is kind of what lets you then, you know, do your aggregation magic. And so here you just send, that's just dereference. So it takes mm -hmm. whatever your count is. And then down here, I just reset it back to zero. And so you get a transducer, it's the same thing. You've got some state, you get a, an input message, this is your two arity, you increment it, that's it. And then here you're, you're closing your transducible process, so just pass on the, the count, basically. Um, and then whatever's running the transducer would be responsible for just discarding it and just creating a new one. So this one doesn't actually reset its own state like the SAMSA task does. Um, the idea would be that you have a task that just creates a new transducing function, like and so your state is just thrown away and rebuilt to the, the default state. So finally, we can do something. So, um, so you know, concretely, this functional composition stuff, you know, you might have a reusable piece. Remember, I showed you the comp step one, step two. 
So, um, so yeah, we kind of called them something internally because we really don't like the name transducer. But um, so you've got two queries, counting and something else. But you can just compose your before query stuff, which might be like doing some custom metrics or authorization or whatever, like you know whatever you want to do. But so you have two tasks in a pipeline, and now you can just very easily reuse this piece of logic, right? So you got two queries and do before query stuff on both of them. Um, so this leads to some nice, some nice buzzwordy properties like, you know, all of your logic is encapsulated. It doesn't have any kind of dependencies on even SAMSA itself, right? Um, you can really kind of write your SAMSA layer that then composes the rest of your queries, like after you've mapped all of SAMSA's constructs into like non-SAMSA constructs. So. Um, Let's see. So you can kind of you can mock it as well without anything heavy like Mockito if you want or need to. Um, but the idea here is, you know, we had counting query on the previous page. So into an empty vector, run counting query, nil would be the context. So um, and then run it on. These are kind of the fake messages that go through A, B, C, D, E. So we expect one thing to come out, and that's five, because we're just counting. Um, and then with redefs, this just says for before query stuff, you know, normally it would be this function that might have some dependence on, you know, stuff with context and message. Like actually, that's valid closure, which is pretty cool. But um, this might be SAMSA specific stuff. We don't want that in our test case. That's not what we're looking at right now. So you can just, you know, ignore that by mapping over identity. And then that'll just pass in whatever went in. So, um, that makes sense. <coughs> chirp, chirp. <laughs> I'll, I'll assume that it does. Um, so then, if you actually do want to test, you know, your pieces that touch Java, you can also kind of this. This means basically implement this interface. And since Samza is made made of all kinds of really small interfaces that are, you know, single purpose, you can just kind of um, make it. So this is just taking message collector, collector implementing the send method, um, taking the envelope, and each time you get an envelope, um, sent is a list. Conjoin means put it onto the end of the list. Uh, technically a vector, if, like, if, you, if you care that much. But, so put it onto the end of the vector, and that's it. So now we can actually create our task, give it the initial state of zero, um, and then we can kind of set up the expected and actual in the same way. Um, does that make sense? So kind of to wrap up, um, I guess I actually have a lot of time left. But uh, so I guess that just gives us more Q&A time or to like kind of dig into stuff. So TLDR on closure, it's basically JVM and Maven, the good parts. Like you don't have POMs, you don't have like, like very explicit languages, et cetera. Yet you still get all these advantages. You get first class Java interop, which means any Java library that's out there you can use, or you know, Scala, whatever. Um, because Clojure is basically designed to give you first class access to the host OS, which is, or the host um, runtime, which is Java. So the dot special form gives you full access to, direct access to Java objects. Type hinting for the spots where it can't figure it out. It can figure it out if you know, you're implementing a Java interface that's typed. Like it kind of knows the stuff that comes in is of that type. And so it, it passes it through, but you know sometimes you just it doesn't know, so you have to give it a hint. Um, and you know then you get, you know you can still use Jenkins, you can still use Artifactory, you can still use all your favorite stuff. Um, testing in TDD is it's very simple and clean. Like you can use Makito if you want, but you can really just get by um, by just like reifying these interfaces. Um, in large part just because of how SAMS is designed. Like some systems aren't so friendly, they use a lot of statics, et cetera. So um, thanks to Clojure, uh, uh, thanks to SAMSA, you know, Clojure is a very good language to build on. Um, and especially um, JFR, do you guys, are you guys familiar with that flight recorder? <laughs> that, that was like the most helpful thing in tuning our SAMSA tasks. Like we didn't know about it until pretty late into our development process, but once we found it, like, you know, just, just record it for a while and you can just like see exactly what's happening with 
with the JVM, exactly how much time was spent in G's garbage collection, et cetera. Um, so we were able to really optimize our tuning with that. Um, and then, of course, you get functional composition, which is putting the steps together, and repling, which is like super cool and fun. Um, so, like, sort of points on performance um, to summarize is serializing took by far most of our CPU time. Next was reflection. We had three instances of reflection that we added type hints to, and we got a 40% performance gain. So, this is going to be like true if you use like any dynamic language, which like we're SAMSA meetups, so we're probably not oriented that way to begin with, but just to kind of, you know, um, speak to, you know, like Python fans, et cetera, because we're like a very heavy Python shop, and I have a feeling, you know, Java's, nobody's really resisted us, because like numbers and results are speaking a lot louder than any kind of bias people have, but seriously, like, Closure and Java are just like super fast compared to, I mean, a lot of things, so. Um, and then, we're still kind of experimenting with the GC. We know what properties we're looking for. We just haven't tried all the combinations of the different GCs. So, I mean, if anyone's like a super, you know, JVM buff and can give us some tips about like what GCs to use for closure and stuff, that would be really cool. Um, otherwise, we're gonna have to figure it out. Um, and we kind of know, you know, so, I mean, and these are our conclusions that we're sharing as well. Um, you know, we sort of know that after a certain amount of time, like, we don't necessarily want to promote things from young gen to old gen anymore, because it's all just transient messages and some caching and whatever that's happening, like, in our process. But, like, for the most part, the system's running. So, um, you know, like, talk to me if you have any tips for us. Um, this is just kind of, like, buzzword, immutable data, et cetera. Like, we hear it's fast, closure is fast. Um, there's ways to get direct access to, to um, I guess, unlocked versions of the objects through these things called transients. And given that Clojure has no multi-threading, like, it's perfect. Like, transients are locked to your thread. And, you know, that's fine. It's perfectly fine with Samza. So, you know, that's, that's a lock you can, uh, or a, a small boost that we could get. But um, we just haven't gone there yet. So... Um, we've got some open implementation challenges, which is mostly just due to our sort of still internalizing this way of thinking about our problems. So um, I guess, you know, I could talk more about this if you guys have specific questions, but, you know, like, I don't know what's interesting to a general audience. Um, so, yeah, basically, thank you, uh, LinkedIn and SAMHSA and Kafka teams and PubNub for letting us spend so much time doing our diligence, like, getting the system ready for production. So yeah, I've got, uh, looks like about 15-ish minutes for questions, so. Um, you were showing in closure composition across functions. Uh-huh. Are you able to do composition across tasks as well, like tasks? So, so how do you do that? Because they could be on separate JVMs, so how do you represent that in closure? Right, so it that's, um, I think that's something that is, it's more like conceptual still at this point, but given that Clojure's a, it's, um, it's compiled, it's statically typed, um, there's something called Clojure typed that you could use to kind of really make the, the types between the steps explicit. And so from there, you could kind of statically analyze the code and dynamically make a set of SAMHSA tasks that you could deploy. Or just as a programmer, you can, you can know. So like step zero is, is just, um, I'll go back so that we can see concretely. So, so basically what you're saying is, you know, this, this is a composition, um, this returns a function, this returns a function, this composes the two functions together. So is there a way to break it up at this yeah, line? If I understand this correctly, those two functions could theoretically be each a SAMHSA task. Right. They could be a separate JVM. Right. Um, so, so yeah, basically, um, Right now, the way these are, like, a comp is another function. So, so really, you'd be running one of these per task is um, kind of what I'm trying to communicate here. Um, theoretically, you could, you could chain these two, if these were two tasks in a row, for example, 
like say you augment it with some stuff and then you aggregate it with that stuff that you augmented with. I mean, theoretically, if you had a, a SAMSA container that just ran a transducer on whatever input it got from the, the input system that it was configured to read from and then wrote to the output system that it was configured to, um, each, each of these two things could be composed into a single SAMSA task because the result of composing two transducers is another transducer. So it's really, without, it, without smarter tooling, you, you have to kind of know what you want to go on each task and, and deploy it that way. But with smarter tooling, you know, it's, this is all kind of getting into theory, but. So at the moment, functional composition across tasks and different JVMs, this, that's yeah. not what's going on. Yeah, that's not what's going on. Okay, yeah, so if anyone was confused, yeah. This is, the, the idea is this is a task, this is a task. This is some code that's in your code base that's used by each task. But this itself is not, um, you know, breaking up into separate SAMSA tasks dynamically. Yep. Um. So when do you use it with Kafka and when do you use it with 0MQ? Uh, if you can talk a little bit about the scenario and such. Sure. Um, so so I'm, from, I'm working with PubNub right now. So we've got, you know, an existing infrastructure that's not built on Kafka. We've been around for, you know, a number of years. So it's all kind of legacy stuff built on 0MQ and a lot of Python, et cetera. So basically, our, our pipeline doesn't use 0MQ, but all of our existing infrastructure that's there to consume messages, uh, or basically take, take things that are published from our customers. So to back up, Pub, PubNub is a, a company that sells basically a, a PubSub service that runs on a bunch of different platforms. So all of our traffic is publish, subscribe, and then some services that are built on top of that. So, so it's like we've got all this infrastructure that's not Kafka, that's not Java. And so we built 0MQ um, consumer. It's a, so 0MQ has something called a push-pull socket. So we've got part of our system that pushes out to other systems that's a 0MQ push socket. And so we basically made a connector that goes in a very simple task that just repeats it back into SAMSA, uh, sorry, back into Kafka serializes protobuf. So we've got an ASCII-based protocol that comes off of 0MQ. And then we take that in, in a task in a 0MQ um, pull um, consumer system. And then basically just take that ASCII message and then convert it into a protobuf message and then publish it back out into another Kafka topic, which is then used by the rest of our pipeline um, as protobufs. So you mentioned that the, uh, the scalability you, you, you wanted, the, it was based on, like, one of the factors was threading and partitioning. So um, in, in your staging environment that you're uh, going to bring to production, how many partitions did you, did, did, did you, did you configure and, and how many requests were you able to consume? Um, so we have, we have different tasks. So we have an augmentation step that handles about, depending on our settings, we've been able to get it up to about 15,000 lines per, uh, 15,000 um, Kafka messages per second at about, I think our average is like about a kilobyte per message or so. So it ends up being like 15 megabytes per second. Um, and then we have another step though, which is the new streaming aggregator, which actually gets, um, it can aggregate, which would be something like, you know, taking it, looking at one of the fields of the message and counting by that field and then emitting the result once per second. We were able to, we've been able to get about um, 60,000 messages per second uh, per partition. And so we end up, um, you know, I guess I can't necessarily like say how wide it is, but per partition, that's about what we're seeing. Oh uh, yeah, it's just like per partition I can say. Yeah, so anything else? In the back? Sure, yeah, so the question was, can I, can I talk about our cluster architecture and how we make it highly scalable and available? So the, the scalable part, it's basically, you know, 
all of these pieces are pretty much horizontally scalable, except for Zookeeper. That's like the one thing we're kind of like, okay, how is this going to work? We kind of take people's word for it because like a lot of big companies are using it on a lot of huge systems. Um, we know that we can't do it sort of across regions. Of you know we we uh, so we have 15 data centers in six availability zones, I believe. So we haven't done a lot of work. We're we're sort of like just done with phase one, which is single single region. So there we have um, we have Zookeeper backed resource managers with a hot standby. And then we've got um, 2x replication on our Kafka clusters, um, which we're also fed in by a system that's already atomic, which is our legacy system. So we don't necessarily need to, to be redundant in the Kafka layer, but we are. Um, and it's sort of like, we've got, we've got a th uh, three Kafka nodes with 2x replication, so we can still handle one failing and, and not even sweat. Um, and then, um, yarn node man, you know, yarn does its thing. So we've just got enough node managers to, you know, to handle, um, you know, our traffic or any sort of like spikes in our traffic. But as far as like cross region stuff goes, we haven't gotten into that yet. How do we do capacity planning? So we're seeing pretty linear properties with the system. Um, you know, we started it with like just a very small. We're, we actually started just running log lines through it to see how fast it could go. And then we sort of like scaled it up to some of our traffic, and then we scaled it up to a region worth of traffic. And it's been pretty linear. So we're, we're basically projecting our expansion to the other regions based on what we found um, running it in our biggest region. So, um, but you know, again, it's, in, it's been like pretty linear mm -hmm. and we can kind of like find the ceiling of where, where a, a um, a stage in our pipeline performs, and then just you know, give give the uh, give enough partitions for it to work, and then Samza takes care of creating uh, a partition for each of our, or sorry, a, a container for each of our partitions. So it's like that's that's one of the really nice things that we that that drew us to Samza. Does that make sense? Uh, so we're using AWS currently. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're not quite into production. So we're just using um, we're using just regular instances, not not spot, not long term reserved. But so you know we're paying probably more than we need to right now. But we're kind of not quite in production yet. So once we get there, then we're, we'll focus on. Um, you know, longer term planning. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got a Librato dashboard. Um, we've also got some check out. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was do we do any kind of monitoring? So we've got uh, some check MK stuff going on just for like host level stuff and basic checks. And then we're also actually using SAMS's metrics frameworks pretty heavily. So we've got a, a process that just listens to the Kafka metrics topic and kind of takes all that stuff and then pushes them out to StatsD. So we've got dashboards there. And it just, you know, the, the, the data structures that SAMSA provides for, for metrics are pretty good. Actually, one thing that's interesting, well, I, I'll talk about that offline, but yeah, it's like we're seeing kind of performance issues around actually having all of these timers working at such a high rate. Um, but you know we haven't filed any bugs or anything yet because it's like not enough of an issue that it's like 50% of our performance. But it's like, you know, we can we basically disable some of our metrics um, in order to get more throughput. So probably be seeing something in Jira like pretty soon about that. Um, does that answer your question? Cool. Um, just side side comment on that too. Something that's pretty cool is you can actually write a SAMSA task. To consume your metrics topic, isn't that sweet? <laughs> um, anything else? Yeah. So you, the uh, the de the developers were <clears throat> previously not closure folks. What was the cultural transition to uh, get people to actually adopt closure and be cool with it? 
oh, it's fine. Um, so I'm one of the developers, and I have another um, another guy who's working with me um, who's got more of a Python background. So you know, I'm I've done Java for most of my career. I kind of went from from C to Perl to well, actually started with Visual Basic, but it's like completely different. Um, and then kind of skipped over Rails, um, skipped over Node to a large degree, just like doing Java stuff because like pretty solid, right? Like JVM really has a bad rap, but starting with like Java five and six, like it's. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm preaching to the choir in this audience, like. Um, but so culturally, it's just the numbers spoke for themselves. I mean, there was P Python and Clojure aren't that different, and you know, so it's like me with a Java background saying JVM's tight, don't worry about it. Another guy who did, you know, kind of turned us on to Clojure, he just like, you know, he's an awesome guy, like super smart, knows what he's doing. And he was just like whipping out all this stuff with Clojure, we couldn't even keep up with them. So that kind of spoke to us, we decided to try it out. Um, and then just like as we started doing benchmarks and load testing and getting to know it and like getting all the right Vim plugins, et cetera, like it just became like, it's fine, and, and so the people who use it in our company, I think, are pretty well respected, and, but beyond that, we're, we've actually been kind, we're very much greenfield, so like, nobody else in the company is like, doing what we're doing yet. They like, kind of see us, hanging around, doing this stuff, talking about stuff, but um, we, haven't, we haven't had any kind of adoption um, resistance yet, so, and when it, you know, if we ramp on another developer into this closure stuff, like, I really don't think, anyone will object to it. I mean, we've got, we've got numbers for everything we've done. I mean, it's, it's pretty clearly a technically awesome solution. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. On your, uh, your closure projects, do you use Lanigan to basically build uh, a task implementation and then, uh, I guess with SAMSA, it has to be a, a tarball, right? And then, so you, your build process takes that Lanigan output, you know, jar or whatever creates a tarball and that's what you deploy to the SAMHSA uh, yarn environment? Yeah, so I, I had mentioned, um, you know, for to make a, a custom lining in uh, plugin, you just put in, you know, source lining or plugins lining in whatever. So we've actually got one called tar. So that depends on, on the jar, the Uber jar having being built, which is the jar with all its dependencies in it. So you basically take the Uber jar, you know, whatever resource files we need to put in um, and then just like the tar task, it just uses like whatever compression. It's like, you know, maybe a, a 50 line task, task that'll just make a tar ball with everything that we needed, including the Uber jar. So, and then, uh, you know, Jenkins then makes that available as the last successful build artifact. And then that's basically what we put into our um, job descriptor. All right. Thank you. Yeah, one more. Oh, one more. If, if last we have one. Time. Last one. Okay, last one. Are you using Yarn for deployment, and how was that experience? Um, we're running it. We're, you know, we're still figuring it out. Operationally, it it's fine. I mean, we, you know, we're using um, we're using Ansible and just putting it in and submitting it. Like, we're not, you know. Something later on that we want to do is like actually make like a custom job submitter like manager application. But for now, we've just been sort of like in development. We run an Ansible script, and you know it gets done. So, all right. Thank you very much. Yep.